name's Peter Bonnell. I'm the senior curator at Quad and also the format. Uh, I work as former as one of the curators, one of the curatorial team. And as you may well know, there is an amazing virtual exhibition that you can go and visit, um, format.newart.city, which is in the chat link there. Please go, if you haven't already, I'm sure you already have, go in there, have a look, 20 rooms, including the information centre. Uh, an amaz amazing, immersive experience, hundreds of artists from all around the world. The festival itself is on through till the uh, 11th of April, but is actually live for two years on the New York City site. So um, tonight is a sure to be fascinating Q&A between um, our guest curator, Marina Polenka, and one of our featured artists in the uh, approximation of the facsimile of Quad Gallery in room one in the virtual space in New York City, and that's Julian Huxtable. The uh, theme of the festival this year, and it changes each time the festival takes place, is control. And the main exhibition that the guest curator Marine has curated is called Matrix, Fluid Bodies, Unlimited Thoughts, as well as featuring three great artists, including Julianne, it features Tabita Rizir, uh, Martin uh, Guterres, um, and tonight, um, Marina and Juliana are going to talk about, particularly about the curatorial overview of the show and Juliana's practice, which ranges across a number of years and is uh, in an astonishing body of work. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, without further ado, at the end, we will, I will ask any questions that anyone has. Well, I, uh, I've got great pleasure in handing over to Marina Polenka in uh, Zagreb, Croatia, and Julian Huxtable in New York City. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Peter, for a, a nice introduction. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Hello, Juliana. It's nice to see you again. Uh, I really much enjoyed the uh, curated uh, in curation of this uh, show and work with all three artists and I'm pleased and excited to have you Juliana as a uh, first of my artists uh, speaking about their uh, practice. Uh, tell me you are now in New York. How are you and how do you spend your days in this situation of COVID and epidemic how it's reflected to your life? Um. I'm so I'm I'm generally good. My time in New York has been a bit intense. I had like a I had a an a, apartment crisis, so I suddenly moved. So I'm all of the the intense things are generally done. So most of my days are spent setting up my apartment. Like you can see my TV is like on the floor over here. Um, but generally speaking, I would say that COVID, it's been an interesting period. I think it's been a, uh, a period of a lot of reflection. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's been a period where I've done a lot of, I've, I've done a lot of writing. I think writing has been my, writing and music have been my primary kind of creative work that I've been, um, that I've been doing. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to go back to I mean, not that there's going back to a normal life, but it will be strange for me to return because I was no, I'm such a normally so such a workaholic and constantly going. I have gotten quite used to a little bit of like domesticity, so that's quite new. Um, it still feels new, but I have I've I've definitely adjusted to that. So yeah, I can imagine. It's actually, I mean, you are more limited. New York and living part-time in Berlin and during the first lockdown you found yourself actually stuck in Berlin and how was there I mean I guess you as you said find more time to be focused on your writings but how was that experience um in the beginning it was very difficult because I had so many things planned for this year and it was particular it was particularly difficult because I I, I built, or this year, last year, I built 2020, I had planned it around, essentially everything was, was music focused, or generally music focused, music and performance. And so my, all of my income was essentially around different music residencies and then touring and playing live. And so, which was kind of the worst 
thing you could bank on for COVID because that was the one thing that there was just not really a, an alternative. There was no, there was no, you know. Yeah, I saw that you have like, like lifeline for music, really. Yeah. Um, and so I found the beginning really difficult, but then I, I really enjoyed being Ber in, in Berlin. It was the longest that I had been anywhere for a single stretch of time for, you know, like eight or nine years because I'm, I'm, I'm traveling so much. Um, and so I felt like I really got to know this city a lot. And I think that the, the introspection was really valuable. Mm -hmm. It was really, really valuable for me because I was away from, I had, no, I had no studio, music or art. And so I suddenly was like, okay, well, how, how do I exist as an artist? How do I exist as a person generally with just essentially like a, my bedroom? Mm -hmm. And so it was like a, definitely a shift in how I thought about my practice. Um, and I'm still, I am finding it like now I'm in New York. I, I'm still like, like even what to do in my, my studio feels like new again somehow. <laughs> I had always been in a motion, but. Yeah, but yeah. Probably it was really like a period for introspection. Uh, speaking of your music, and we really enjoyed last week listening to your DJ set that you prepared for us. It was last Wednesday. And uh, actually, I was always fascinating. Where did you find inspiration of getting, I mean, getting idea of different sounds, putting them, incorporating them in your sets? For example, I remember once I heard part of the church core singing uh, a cappella inside. So I guess there's a lot of different impacts uh, to your music and music set. So maybe we can go like uh, in your uh, early age and maybe you can describe like the way how you grow up, the environment, uh, your family and what actually impacts to you before you moved uh, from Texas to New York. Um, well, I grew up, I grew up in the South. So I grew up mostly in Texas and a, a little bit in Alabama um, and a very short, a very short period in, in New Mexico. And I grew up in a generally religious, my, very religious family. My, my town was small. It was conservative. It was very um, racially segregated. Um, and my social life and my life outside of school basically revolved around the church. And so the church was really kind of the central kind of like ideological structure in my life. And I was found a lot of frustrations with that. Obviously the politics of the church aren't always so progressive, but I do find, I did find the church to be really kind of inspiring aesthetically. Um, I think that um, the way that, because it's everything is allegory. So I grew up in a Black Baptist church and, you know, not that people were using the term, you know, liberation theology, but the general idea, um, the basis of the Black church is that you read the Bible and especially the Old Testament and the kind of like persecution of the children of Israel and the story of Exodus especially become allegories, mm -hmm. um, if not literal historical precedents to the kind of like black diasporic experience. And so there's a really rich tradition of like so many layers, everything is really layered in, um, in the kind of black, black church experience. And I think that even when I was no longer literally going to church all of the time, um, because when I left, when I left, uh, I, I didn't really go to church. I would occasionally visit when I would go back or I would go to Harlem sometimes. But I think that the kind of aesthetic tradition of the Black church and of liberation theology and of, and of taking something that maybe was culturally foreign to you or wasn't meant as your specific narrative and using it and, that's, and, and incorporating and reworking it and rereading it and like building a kind of religious mythological system from that, I think has really um, mm -hmm. stuck with me over the years. And then, so I left, I left my town and I went to Bard College. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I thought that I would study. I went there. I basically lied to my parents because both of my parents were very, the idea of education was generally built around jobs. It was like education is a key to economic mobility, like the idea that you would study something that doesn't clearly translate to a trade or an industry or something was sort of foreign. And so I lied and said that I was studying ec economics and political science. <laughs> Very close. <laughs> um, but started, I was taking art classes. Um, I was taking studio art classes in the beginning, but then I found the experience a bit alienating. It's, 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 it's so strange coming from my background to be at a school of, of a very wealthy people whose relationship to art, whose relationship to schooling is kind of just like very laissez-faire, like almost performatively distanced from a trade or a profession or even like, I would argue so at times that the school felt like just like technique, skill, like I was like, I'm in you painting school, painting, like, yeah. I mm -hmm. yeah. would like to learn how to paint, you know, um, not just be told that, you know, it's just experimentation. And so I really, I ended up studying literature and gender studies. Um, and then really just distanced myself. I totally cut myself off from the idea of being an artist. Um, mm -hmm. I think by the time, by my sophomore year, I was just like, I'm no longer doing this. This isn't really feasible for me. And I also, in the back of my mind, I always was thinking like, well, how am I going to support this life that I want in New York? That's definitely not gonna happen. Just like making art at Bard College. And so I think that was also a, a kind of quiet motivator um, and when I moved to New York, I got like a really uh, kind of normal job. I was a legal assistant at the ACLU, mm -hmm. um, but I was always on my computer, obviously. And so, you know, everyone has their little side, like some people, their thing is that like, you know, some people are, are news junkies. Some people are, you know, some people have certain blogs that they like to follow. They're like, and for me, my the time that I passed not doing work, but still being at a computer was on Tumblr. Yeah. And so I really found that the kind of gray area between an aggregator or a sort of like someone who's just like sharing other things and then commenting on those things and that kind of commentary sharing as a space which can be creative or productive in its own right was the space in which um, that space and then nightlife kind of concurrently were the two spaces in which I started to Then you also started understand. going out. So you have actually online dynamic, online world for your experimentation when you started to be obsessed with dressing and also going out and starting to discovering also your performative uh, yeah. of your practice. Um, can I pause for just like 30 seconds because I, my, the delivery man is ringing my door because I have a package coming. Okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah. We, we, we stopped on uh, Tumblr and going out and a lot yeah. of followers that you are start to gaining on online. Yes. And so um, I guess a, a, another important aspect from that, that also began in my childhood is that both of my parents were heavily invested in technology. Like my, mm -hmm. my dad was a, was a polymer engineer and then my mom worked in database engineering. And so both of them really understood the idea of technology as this, this like golden opportunity for, for black people to um, improve their conditions, both the like the intellectual possibilities, creative possibilities, but also like economic mobility. And so I, since I was a really, really, really young child, always had access to computers, always had access to the kind of newest technology because they both were in and out of university systems. And so, um, and my mother very early on, because uh, I was raised mostly by my mother, but my mother very, very early on 
you know, I always loved painting. I always liked making poems. And my mom always encouraged me to translate whatever that kind of analog skill, for lack of a better term, into a digital. So even just like Microsoft Paint, which most, most people just think of as kind of like a joke technology, if you're, if you're old enough to remember Microsoft Paint, it was just like single, pic, like pixel by pixel, kind of very, just like the most 2D you could possibly be um, software. But as a young child, I would make Microsoft Paint art and then I would print them out and I would like sell them. And so there was a very early relationship to technology and I and and I loved blogging I loved um, early kind of like a myspace live journal blogspot angel fire like um, kind of like free website hosting and so I was always really invested in in technology and so what I think was so fascinating to me about tumblr um, at that time was that it it, it was still in the like the blog era or what I've come to understand mm -hmm. as like desktop technology, like the kind of like desktop as the primary interface to kind of web-based um, web based experiences um, was really, really, really generative for me. And I think that my comfort with technology, I never got rid of that. So even when I had imposter syndrome related to being an artist or felt alienated from like painting or these other fields. I never lost my sense of like a deep connection with technology and the possibilities for that technology is offered. And so um, it, yeah, it was through Tumblr that I, but you know, I started making like videos. Of your followers, what was definitely, I mean, important for you. Yeah. Um, and then concurrently, the, the, the nightlife aspect. I've always been obsessed with, with nightlife. Like when I was a kid, um, I had every Studio 54, every book on Studio 54. I was just like, that, that to me was just the, the coolest thing. You know, the coolest historical moment to me as a child, all of my like screen names always had 54 in them. Um, and you know, I would make videos with my brother and sister where I would pretend to be downtown Julie Brown and like my brother and sister, uh -huh. we would like put on like a disco ball and put on all this music and I would interview them as if they were like, you know. Well, they were first like, performances. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But then at what point you joined the House of Ladosha, the art collective, and how was that experience? Um, You're still there. I mean. it's, it's, I, I started off as a I started off as a fan. Uh -huh. um, so the House of Ladosh is both like it's both a house of people like that 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 are all you know artists or creatives in some capacity. But then there was also the musical act, which is which was most people who knew about House of Ladosh knew it as the musical act, and that's how I first found out about them. And I booked them to come to bar because I, I, I booked music shows and also parties when I, I started throwing parties when I was in school. And they're super hard to reach. They're like, they're, you know, it's like I basically had to track them down at part me and my best friend Booyong at the time. We would like come to New York and just like go to whatever parties we knew they would be at and then like track them down to be like, please come play at our school. Um, and so I finally convinced I finally convinced them to play my senior year. And then when I moved to New York, they because they're 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 night creatures. Um, mm -hmm. um, and so I I would just see them out all the time. And it was it was and I I met them obviously because I had booked um, Doja and Adam to play, but we just had like a shared sensibility. Like I, I really, I really just thought like these are the coolest people I've ever met because they, they were, most of them met in college. And so most of them went to the new school, but you know, there's like, uh, not exclusively, but that, that's where most of them met. And there was just no hierarchy in terms of, um, 
subculture, points of access, like modes of knowledge. Like we could go from talking about a book to talking about a film to talking about, you know, using and we and and there was like such a, a wide span of language that mm -hmm. uh, that was appreciated within the group. Um, and everyone really had a very advanced and I think kind of like ahead of their time relationship to digital media and social media. And they were so funny and so smart. And um, I was just so, I was just happy that they wanted, that they thought I was cool. I was just so happy to hang out with them. And then they ended up becoming, that ended up becoming my, you know, my, my family in New York. Exactly. I mean, for, for so many years to uh, performing to the, together, I can imagine. But then slowly, I mean, you you produce the music, DJing, performing, doing things with sound, writing, and step by step, I mean, you started to developing your rich practice. And when you became like self-aware of what is it, what it is, I mean, also after the college you started with your process of transition you were born intersex so all together when that moment happened and before all these big shows um it's hard to say exactly because i think one of the things that i i suffered from and still suffer from to a certain degree is like extreme kind of imposter syndrome um i've gotten over that to for the most part, especially when it comes to art, but I, I couldn't call myself a writer. I couldn't call myself a poet. I couldn't call myself an artist for years. And I think part of that was maybe leftover baggage that I had from my experience at Bard being in the school where, where I was around all of these like, you know, rich kids who went to Waldorf schools that were making, you know, modernist paintings or what are what, what they thought of as like in a in certain like traditions of abstraction or experimentation or like whatever when they were in high school and and labeling that was that was really that the, i i was like oh in my high school we just learned how to draw and we learned how to paint and i would just like you know depict certain things and like i knew about you know i knew about all of the big artists but but it was really about learning a skill and I think that that initial feeling of like, oh, there's something that I don't have access to here. Like, mm -hmm. I don't understand what this relationship to art is and people see me. I remember one of my prof professors said that I was um, basically like trapped or like trapped by my obsession with like technique and um, identity. Mm -hmm. And that was the criticism mm -hmm. that two of my professors basically gave me, which I think is kind of just like textbook, mm -hmm. a very problematic relationship to like, you know, educating a young art student. But I, that gave me a sense of like, oh, well, I'm not this, like art is not what I do. Like I might be, you know, I can, might be a good writer in a kind of like essay sense or something, but, exactly. and so mm -hmm. it it's was really, and this is why, that that fluidity in mediums and in, in those practices please continue yeah and i think that this is why what's so interesting and valuable to me about my experiences with social media and especially early on in tumblr is that i was able to see myself through other people mm -hmm. and that's what i knew mm -hmm. what i needed was a community of people that I could engage with that could see and recognize qualities in me that I couldn't even see in myself. And so, and, and I feel really lucky that I, that I was lit, it was in New York at that specific moment, that specific moment in like, in digital media and like social media, because it was basically through like other, like people would reach out to me and say, you need to do a reading. This is like, you know, we're really into your writing, come do a reading. Uh, uh, we'd love to publish something that you've done in this collection. And then people would get back to me. And eventually I got to a point where I was just like, okay, fine, I'm a writer. But <laughs> it took years, you know, of, 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 of really being in conversation with other people and just being a part of these like vibrant social ecosystems in order for that to happen. Um, and we're and... 2012, 2013, and then 
Two yeah. years later? I would say even into 2015. Like, I still, even when the triennial was happening, I still had a hard time calling myself an artist, actually, which is absurd. Was, but... like, like, one day they invited you to be presented in New York Museum, and, like, uh, what was your, like, approach? How did you decide what to show? Um, well, I had been because I had I had very little resources, especially after I quit my so I quit my job in this in the spring of 2013, my day job, and I had I was so broke, um, and so I really had I had no studio, I had no I didn't even have a camera. Um, I didn't, I had like a really, really shitty like droid. So like I got my first smartphone in 2014 or maybe the end of 2013. And so I, aside from like these like selfies and little things, I, I, I loved disposable cameras. So I would take like, you know, um, I, I, I was constantly like taking photos of myself with that, but I really, I didn't have access to so much. And so performance became the prime, performance and writing together became the primary way that people understood me artistically, unless you followed me on Tumblr or something like that, in which case you would, you know, there was more things that I was sharing in that context. And so I was approached for the triennial, um, aware that I, like, they were aware that I had been, that I had made like a range of work, but really they were, they had, what kind of captivated them was performance because that's how I had been, especially institutionally. I was sort of in the performance circuit um, uh, in New York uh, or in New York and in LA. And they wanted me to do, at first they were like, you can do something performative. But I, I, I at that point I thought, you know, cause there's a little bit of like a performance ghetto you can get stuck in where it's like, okay, we have our exhibition programming and then it's like, okay, like, what do we do? What's the community? What's the like event programming? And it's relegated to the secondary status. And they're like, let's throw three hundred dollars at whoever's in the like performance mix at the time, and just like see what they can do. And that was really generative for me. But I was like, that to me is not the most interesting thing to do right now. Um, and I especially thought, because at that time, that was like very, that was still like in, in arts, there was not much, I didn't think the conversations around transness were, were really that sophisticated. Mm -hmm. I still think they're kind of stunted in a lot of ways, but I was like, I don't want to, there's such a tradition of like queer people and queer people of color and people of color generally being relegated to performance. I was like, I want to make visual work. And I've wanted to make visual work for a long time, but a lot of the a lot of that has just been resource questions of like resource space, etc. And so they gave me a studio, and I you know I proposed the series that um, the U Universal Crop Tops, and it was yeah. The, I think there was there was like a lot of conversations around that, but that's essentially how that happened. Where I was just like, mm, I don't know if I want to do the performance thing. I don't. I think that this is an opportunity to really not only make work that's important to me, but it's also, I want to switch up the conversation of just like, mm -hmm. like black and queer and trans bodies being relegated to like performance and having to like constantly mm -hmm. inhabit like presence and the fetish of all of that. I was like, I kind of want to distance myself from that, from mm -hmm. this, especially since moment. literally really make it so well known. And first series of uh, cell portraits were born that you are now also famous for and I'm really interested in like the story behind how like what impacted to you to make this series of cell portraits that you also exhibit together with your writings with your poetry and then um maybe so also share the screen if you have uh, visuals of the oh, yes, saint for becoming so I, um, there's a lot of symbols. I, that, that actually the inspiration for that show was like largely thinking about liberation theology. It was like, I was going back to, um, questions of, questions of 
kind of like allegory, symbolism, um, kind of also thinking about me as someone who's existed largely online and the idea, what, what I love about uh, Tumblr and like just like digital culture at that time generally is that an image could be unmoored from its origin or context and could circulate in so many different ways. And so for me, it was really interesting to think about like in the same way that so much of uh, Negro spirituals and um, like kind of black diasporic relationships to kind of like the Old Testament is like investing them with these like political meanings that aren't necessarily so obvious. And so, you know, and like even like um, slaves communicated with each other through messages that were encoded in spirituals because they knew that under the guise of like a more conservative religion that was ultimately an ideology that um, slave masters and white supremacist institutions but wanted black people to participate in because it fed them a narrative that naturalized their oppression encoding that with messages that could be clear to other black people that but that could hide and like weren't so obvious to other white people and so i was thinking about like that relationship to symbolism imagery in abstraction and if i could create images that would circulate in an intentional way so can i create an image that both appeals to a kind of like queer sci-fi afrofuturist sensibility but also appeals to maybe the like conservative, like the Nuwabian nation, kind of like Hotepi, um, you know, conservative, conspiratorial, like black nationalists yeah. yes. aesthetics. Can yeah. I create an image that can circulate in both of those? Because I knew that this, that the, I knew that the, that these images would be widely documented, widely shared, and would be introduced in so many varied contexts. And so it was about kind of, an experiment in that to um to, to a certain degree. very yeah. attractive and there's um, a symbolism and black woman power and also um, i mean hypersexualized woman body okay i'm going to try and share Okay, can you can you see this? Oh wait, it's saying it's not letting me screen share. Yeah, maybe uh, Peter or Niam can make you a co-host so you can share the screen because. Can you? Is, yeah. Can do you see that? Does it? Is it the it's, PowerPoint? I can see it. Okay. Um, and so like these are the type of images that I was thinking of as like inspiration images because these are images, they're kind of like really popular, you know, it's like an artist in Atlanta will generate these images and they're sold in like uh, black bookstores and black kind of like, like uh, church stores. We can get church hats and like black Bibles and things like that. Not all of them, obviously some of these aren't Christian specific, but what I loved about these images is that they do the sort of allegorical work that's being done in the sort of like readings of the Old Testament and it applies that as an aesthetic strategy. And so mm -hmm. this, the, the, this, this image here where it's like literal, literally like a black Christ, but, but Christ I, in this image, I see that Christ is being read as like symbolic of like the black body politic at large and there's careful attention played to where like Jesus is obviously created as is imagined as a black man but the Romans persecuting him are obviously white and so it's it's a way of using this and presenting this narrative and but encoding it with like uh, quite loaded political um, narratives and stories and so and then this image on the right there's this is this is a trope in this type of imagery but the the kind of warrior, black warrior woman surrounded by Black Panthers and the obsession with Black Panthers is like, you know, obviously tied to, it's, 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 it's impossible to not immediately conjure images of the Black Panther Party, Black Liberation. And I love that just having the Panthers surrounding this woman 
becomes a kind of like testament to um, a kind of like radical black politics, but under the guise of a, of, a, of a very easily kind of like seductive image in a lot of ways. And that the image, so often these images with Panthers feature women as black women in the positions of power, authority, commanding the Panthers. Oftentimes they have weapons. And I think that that is a kind of an, an, an aesthetic advancement where like black women are now brought into the conversation and they can, they can carry the full symbolic performance of the black uh, body politic at large. Um, okay. Um, and these are just more uh, similar images. So I, I was obsessed with these images as a kid. Um, you know, they have my, they, you could find yeah. at my grandmother's house, at my aunt's house, like you could see these images sort of everywhere. And so I wanted to do my own versions of these in different ways, updated to kind of my interest, but also insert my own kind of, like how can I encrypt a kind of like political or cultural like aspiration or statement or, or, or kind of invitation into um, seemingly like the pretty images, you know? No, um, I and specifically Portraiture. I think they have really a huge impact because not only in self-canonized sense of becoming in this series, but later also how you present the body in zoo sexuality and also in Snatch of Callback, we'll, we'll uh, get to it later. I think this was like the crucial moment, like when you discover all these impacts. Yeah. And so this was my, um, this one is like, this is a recurring character and and a lot of my early work, but it was the Nuwabian, the Nuwabian princess. And just to, to try and be a, a brief, the, the, the Nuwabian nation is a sort of like, they were spinoff, an extreme spinoff of the nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. And they do, a, they, it's like, it's almost just like liberation theology, but like cranked up to like 3000 or something where they do this, really insane reading of all of the Abrahamic religions. Um, but it, then they link it to kind of like Egyptology and UFOlogy. And there's like up the, like the, you know, all of the original creation stories down through Cain and Abel are actually about the, this original kind of reptile alien race that black people are the direct descendants of. Um, and so the betrayal, the, 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 the betrayal story of Cain and Abel is read as the, the, the genesis of white people where, you know, you weren't supposed to have sex with animals or something. And like one of the brothers goes into a cave and like has sex with a dog. And that's where white people come from. But it's like, it, it, it's just crazy, almost cartoonish level. Um, mythology creation and they and they they're really committed to that as an aesthetic pro project which is why i'm so fascinated with the nuwabians like combining christian iconography with early islamic art with um kind of like science fiction like 70s science fiction funk aesthetics to create an aesthetic world that is loaded ultimately with a narrative of um I think it is about black liberation and black redemption, even if the avenue to that is 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 um, ultimate. It's like a black supremacy. It's a black supremacist message, and so it's 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 conservative in a lot of ways. But I wanted to use that because I was so fascinated by what they did, um, and so. And I presented these text pieces with it because I felt it really felt important for me at that time because that was like a very, it felt like, okay, a lot of people are going to be encountering me the first time. And writing is, is, is still, all of my ideas generate originally in, in, in some form of writing, whether it's notes, whether it's poetry, whether it's essay, essayistic writing. And so I really wanted to share this text and this text um, really was about the generative and exciting potential of kind of like digital and like blogging culture, but blogging culture just at the cusp of, of mobile social media, which is a whole, that's a whole different era, but this was written from that kind of cusp moment, which really felt exciting. 
um, to me at the time and also less, a little bit less um, dystopic with the like, because I think that the mobile data, like the shift from desktop to mobile really came with a lot of unfortunate um, kind of, I don't know, basically like wagering basic rights, basic privacy, wagering text, the relationship to text. Like I think desktop formats were inherently more, um, even just because it's a bigger screen, there was a much wider range of media formats and it and I think it 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 I think it, it engendered a bit of a longer attention span, if that makes sense. And so on a blog format, you'll sit down and read an essay, but even me when I see people write, you know, when they're posting essays on their Instagram posts, I'm just like, girl, I can't. I don't I can't read all of them. Um, but it was exciting and the kind of unmooring of aesthetics from the from the from the the burden of authenticity that was also really exciting to me that countercultural symbols could just like crash against each other and mix and mash in this exciting ways I think was in was really enabled um enabled by by this historical moment and so uh, I mean for me it was interesting when you said once uh... I'm not dressing uh, only because I'm going uh, for a job. That's because I also not only writing to leave the sentences on the paper, but also I like to perform it. And actually, the moment when you are reading your own poetry and writing and writing and uh, performing it, I think it's uh, the biggest pleasure also for you, which later we can see in uh, the performance that you did in uh, Bowman. Yeah. Um. So this was this was my kind of like black warrior woman panther where I instead of having literal panthers I because it's from the I I also wrote a poem to go along with this like a, a and I was thinking about like mountains like covered in panther fur um, and so because like I was also interested in abstraction like this was also about like if those previous images that I was inspired by are abstracting a kind of like literal political aspiration or like a contemporary kind of conflict that has clear signifiers into something a bit more where like, oh, now it's just like Panthers as animals. Um, the weapons are these kind of fictional, almost like sci-fi spheres and things like that. It's like, I think of that as like a mode of abstraction. Um, and so, and, and so I wanted to think of these images as another step in a kind of just like, mm -hmm. uh, and in and, and, and one of many pathways that these kind of allegorical encoding encryption could go. Exactly. Um, and I'll just click through the rest of these. Um, uh -huh. This is my like, this is my like, um, gender queer Christ. Gender queer Christ, also a lot of impacts. Um, I need to ask you what, what gender represents to you? Um, it's been, it's so interesting. It's kind of like, Gender represents, has come to represent so many different things to me. And I've gone through, I've, I've had such radically, I've had so many experiences, um, both of gender that's being projected onto me and the gender that's being projected outwardly from me onto other people. I think that gender is, a really fascinating and interesting medium because for me it's almost the most fundamental it's the first step in freeing or abstracting ourselves from the um, prison of like material determinism or the determinism of a kind of like obsession with material form and I think that the more conservative instinct that a lot of people have is to take a take fleshliness, take the materiality of one's body and immediately ascribe a kind of pathology to that. And I think that gender is the first and arguably most like 
the, the, the most primordial space of play that can take us away from that. Mm -hmm. And it's all a sense of play in some sense. Like, yes, there's the, I do think there are, there are things that are innate, but there's no way to understand the things that are innate versus those that are not. And so gender to me is, is, is the most immediate, accessible kind of refusal of determinism, refusal of like pathologizing people based on their bodies. It's, 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 and, and, and it doesn't require anything. Mm. It doesn't matter what the physical form is. You can insist on a kind of like gender play that can exist in, you know, those things can exist in harmony with like the ass social assumptions. Those mm -hmm. things can exist in antagonism. But 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 that's what's so exciting to me about it is that it's immediate. Everyone has access to it. It requires nothing. And for me, I think it kind of like premeditates even or kind of engenders a sense of creative and artistic play, at least for me. And those two things have always been related to each other. And so I, I could never get bored with gender, um, especially when you introduce things that, like technology into the picture. It's just like, it's an endlessly complexifying field. Yeah, I think uh, it's especially visible how you are playing with this in your series uh, in zoo sexuality. So maybe uh, we can go in our virtual exhibition uh, to visit your three artworks that you're showing there. Uh, I'm not sure, did you want to reflect on your performance in MoMA because it's on your slide? Um, we don't have to, like this slide has literally everything okay. I've done. Then maybe yeah, I can, can Peter uh, um, to open the, the gallery. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll do that now, yes. Yeah, uh, if we can stay in front of the zoo sexuality prints, I think nope. it's uh, Not that one. really... Hold uh, on a minute. Just one second while I uh, click on the right window. Actually, you, you showed that series in um, Art Basel, Hong Kong. And yes. uh, you are use, uh, using furies and references to the online world of the culture and other kin and Maybe you can say what this community represents to you. Well, I think that Sorry. it's funny, funny I was talking about this earlier. So I was talking about something parallel mm -hmm. earlier to my, um, I, had, I had therapy like early this morning, which is why I took a little nap. Um, but um, like for me, I think that and maybe don't don't fully stick this to me. This is a this is an idea that's just coming to me now. But that gender can function in a lot of ways, like a kind of cultural sensibility or even a subcultural sensibility. Mm -hmm. And for me, growing up, I always had I always had um, a kind of a sensibility to rustle feathers, a sensibility to kind of like reject like, you know, propriety and all of these things that I think were being like given to me as 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 ideals. But because I grew up in a I grew up in a very strict Christian household. So I was not allowed to, I would never be allowed to dye my hair. Um, cut my hair in a way that was at all a deviation from just like a very conservative idea. The idea of expressing myself in, in clothing, a, a kind of like cultural sensibility that wasn't, didn't fit a pretty strict model, just wasn't really allowed to me. And so it's interesting to think that in the same way that like gender brings up questions of innateness. And I think that's what's so interesting and frustrating and just like difficult and complex about like questions of the full spectrum of, of, of trans gender identities, like is that there is a question of like, no, I have the thing, I have the sensibility, I have the identity, even before it's being expressed, even before there's material form attached to that. And I think that it's interesting to think of 
a lot of the questions around subcultures and authenticity in a similar way. And so I think perhaps what I find interesting about um, so many like different subcultures is that I, and there are so many that I like feel a part of to a lot of, to, I feel a part of them in the sense that there's like, there is a connection to a sensibility, um, whether that sensibility is something that's developed through my experience over time or like, like innate, whatever. Um, but that, that gray space between like how, how it's performed, how it's, how it expresses itself in, in materiality. And I think that's what technology really enables is that it blurs the line between um, like, I think it's, 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 it's easier, like, like thinking of some thinking of like so many people's childhoods, it's very easy to understand gender where it's like, you have a mom, you were assigned, you were assigned female at birth, your mom put you in bows and pink or whatever, and you chose your gender separate from that, but you had no access to any material to like perform what that would mean socially or culturally, or even arguably what it means to you as an individual separate from those things. And so um, I think that, I'm fascinated in understanding subculture in a similar way, I guess, um, and thinking about it in a similar way. And so a lot of my work is about, is about um, subcultural identity and the intersection of subcultural identity and what's enabled or disabled or are reconfigured by media, social media and technology. And so what does it look like um, in an era in which anyone can sort of buy the like fashion signifiers of any subculture you want. You could, you know, and, 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 and that there's oftentimes we live in an age of visual confusion where something even 15 years ago, if I saw someone performing a certain identity through their clothing, adornments, et cetera, I would just assume, oh, this person has like, probably isn't conservative. I don't know, like, I don't know to say that they're fully leftist, but I, I can say that they're not this that's no longer true and in so many forms. And so I think that the kind of inscription and the malleability of fleshliness is really interesting to me. And even thinking of these intermediary cultural moments, like the introduction of tattooing as a performance of countercultural or just like cultural kind of signification. Um, piercing, basic body modification, you know, like um, even like, like the gauges are like stretching out different parts of your body or, and so thinking of those all as, as, as part of a, a field that includes the technologies that allow for like what we think of as gender transition, because I would like to think of those technologies as also potentials for just like completely insane subcultural identity. So what, what is the most extreme kind of like body mod um, goth look like? And so that, that, that's one of the characters from my, from my arena show where it's just like, she's drinking, she's drinking silver iodine obsessively so her skin can turn blue. Um, surgeries that were really put in place for other purposes she's using so she can create horns you know she can like modify her bones like shave different parts of her bone down like from cosmetic procedures that are very gendered but like it's not about gender it's actually about performing this kind of bat like kind of <laughs> human bat intersection but even that intersection isn't just about the animals it's actually about this kind of like macabre like kind of performance of a cultural sensibility. Um, and so that intersection is really interesting to me. Mm. I know this is really worth what you describe now, especially in the context of the topic of our show, but also topic of the format festival, which is control and how technology and different aspects and also technology as a driving force of self have different impacts to uh, to our body, to how we perform our identity and everything else. I think, yeah, this was to the point. And Peter now is uh, uh, in the gallery. Maybe we can uh, uh, see your um, corner where actually we showed the 
three artworks, Infertility Industrial Complex, Nejda Kalbek. Uh, it is reduced, of course, show, because when you show it in uh, Venus Pauling Gallery, it was huge. We kept some uh, elements like bathroom style with the video and prints. And on the left is like selected uh, artworks from zoo sexuality. And the third one that we will see later. So would you like to say maybe something about the this infertility industrial complex? Um, yeah, so both zoo sexuality and interfertility industrial complex were, I think of them as like just distinct iterations but of a of a of a kind of like field of thinking and making that I'm still in that was I was finding myself really almost just like bored by the conversations like it's just like feels so cyclical the conversations around transness where it's like mm -hmm. the like public issues surrounding transness the um, and there's a certain amount of work that's just like necessary, like obviously like there are certain conversations that have to happen over and over again because we are at a really difficult cultural moment where a lot is being unmoored, unearthed, um, understandings, perceptions are shifting on like both sides. There's a lot that's happening. But for me, I was like, this doesn't feel exciting to me and this doesn't feel engendering of freedom i don't feel like the discourse that we're in right now it doesn't feel free it doesn't feel playful so i want to feel out what are the what are the limits where are the limits where's the where's the kind of like interesting space to work in and so i started thinking about so many of the conversations surrounding identity the even before this, even before this specific uh, cultural moment that we're in. So thinking of um, when sodomy laws in the United States were being overturned or when gay marriage was being advocated, which, you know, on face is like, yes, a kind of like conservative, like very like neoliberal rights model, civil rights model, like aspiration. Um, but I found it interesting that it's like, oh, well, if we let them marry, if we let two men marry, if we let two women marry, what's to stop a man marrying from a, marrying a dog? If we let um, someone identify, just like wake up one morning and identify as a man or a woman and like fully be given the social rights that come with that identification, what's to stop me from just saying that I'm a dolphin? And I, I found it interesting that the human animal was the hard line. And even kind of, even a lot of like advocates for a sort of expansion of um, gender possibilities. So even people that were advocates for okay, expanding gender categories, like giving, like recognizing people as how they identify would still, we're still invested in this hard distinction between human and animal. And so I thought, well, why don't I start from thinking from there? Like, let's just jump to that. Like if that's what people are like at, on, on some level shying away from, let's just go there and both think about what that, what that means as an um, imaginative space of possibility, but also the ways in which those distinctions already don't exist. Um, so thinking about bestiality, the relationship between animal food production um, and dairy farming and bestiality, um, because So much of the physical labor that happens between humans and animals in producing that is regulating, controlling, assisting animal sexuality. It's fisting animals, it's fingering animals, it's developing rods that you stick into, you know, the anal canals that then will stimulate the prostate. It's developing really in devices to stimulate a bull and then like, using your hand, it's like a whole, it's really, it's really intense. And ironically, at least, and this is, this is, this is, this is, this is in the States. Um, I don't know about, I don't know the history of bestiality laws um, in the UK, but in the States, 
when sodomy laws were overturned, because those were a part of the argument was that it was like, um, those were biblically based laws. Um, and they were, I think it's the, the, the laws in Leviticus that, um, and so the same laws, the same biblical kind of like prescriptions against what people say is a prescription against um, homosexual mm -hmm. sex um, were also the same scriptures that banned bestiality. And so when sodomy laws were overturned, incidentally, bestiality laws were also overturned and just kind of like rendered null in all 50 states. Um, this is for the Supreme Court case. And so there was a gray area where essentially states didn't have bestiality laws on the books. Something would happen like, and I think it was like in Iowa, like one farmer was like drunk and like had sex with another farmer's goat. Um, and then they start, then they make new bestiality laws, you know, they, laws prescribing like these specific acts with animals are prohibited under bestiality law. And the, um, the, what was funny is that the um, kind of food industry, the kind of meat industry, the meat and dairy industry lobby freaked out because they realized that based on any even moderate definition of bestiality, all <laughs> workers, all dairy and meat industry workers would be liable, would be subject to persecution under the law because the, you know, it's like you're fisting and you're fingering and you're jerking off and you're, just, you're doing all sorts of insane things that are really about a new form of hybrid sexuality of humans and animals meetings. And so there was a whole host of laws that were introduced under animal husbandry. And I just found that really interesting. Um, and so I really loved the idea of creating these images that used a kind of anthropomorphic, anthropomorphized um, like cows as mm -hmm. a way of like getting mm -hmm. at this like gray zone, both as a space of possibility with identification, because I, I identify like I, 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 I don't, I don't identify at all with what I see in like in, in conventional pornography, even the branch of like queer pornography, but I do find myself invested in and identifying with furry like eroticism and furry erotic art. And that's been true for a long time. And so I wanted to create an images, images and characters that could play yeah. at that. If, matrix. If I, yeah, if I uh, understand well, you're also writing a new novel uh, that is going to be published soon, and it directly refers to this uh, artwork. Yeah, so that yeah. the the back characters, kind of like body modification, mm -hmm. um, sort of like goth obsession. Yeah. I'm writing a novel around. Great. Good luck uh, with that. And um, okay, and then we also have a. One part of your actually f first show that you showed uh, in uh, Rena Spaulding's uh, gallery, uh, Speed During Louder at the Rally. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually a video that uh, presents, um, uh, yeah, how, how do you see like the protest and like uh, young people and uh, who are chanting no Trump, no KKK, no fascist USA. And uh, can you say a little bit about this uh, video uh, film and maybe yeah. in the rest of the show was combining with the metal sheets, with posters? Mm -hmm. um, so this show was about grappling with, I think the, what I felt and what so many people around me were feeling like, I so I started working on the show before, well before Trump was even taken seriously as even a, a, a real candidate, because um, I worked on this show for like a year and a half. Um, but even before the literal Trump moment, there was a growing sense that the political symbolism that, that, that we were that we inherited, that I felt like I inherited generationally, just wasn't, it, it, it wasn't activating a kind of sensibility in the way that like, I think I thought it would. Um, I think, so the legacy of 
protest posters, the legacy of like leftist art. So thinking about um, thinking about communists, um, think, thinking about like the global kind of like interrelated socialist movement. So the Black Panthers working with like uh, labor rights activists coming out of Vietnam and like all of these interrelated movements that, that developed, especially in the late 60s like aesthetics that we really, that we inherited that were like, this is a political aesthetic. This is a leftist aesthetic. This represents a kind of aspiration towards uh, workers' rights liberation. This represents a kind of like feminist aesthetic. And, and I think that we exist, we're at a time because this was like sort of post that moment that I think I was dealing with with universal crop tops where it's like images, um, symbols, clothing, uh, typefaces are being unmoored from their origin points and they're all being being thrown into this kind of like vacuum where the, the, the sort of like play of the vacuum is how almost how irresponsible the kind of relationship and the, the piecing of things together is. And I don't, I don't say irresponsible in a kind of to be and to be to like uh, reprimand something, but I, I mean irresponsible in the sense that it it evaded questions of authenticity, like who has a right to use this image? Who has a right to wear this thing? QN on the sideline, a lot of debates around cultural appropriation, but that really, really, really affected, I think, political discourse. And I think it affected the political sensibility of younger people. And I think a lot of the frustration globally with not only like existing political regimes, but also with the, the leftist movements that we had inherited was part, partly out of this failure, the kind of like failure of like political aesthetics. And so I wanted to think about like what that meant, what the implications of that were, um, and also the relationship between because, because I, I think historically what's quite interesting, and this is why I was using buttons and posters and things like that, is that if you think of something, if you think of something like uh, the cultural conversation and legacy that was introduced via kind of like early, early punk, I think that a lot of it is about emptying political symbols of that literal meaning and inserting them with this sense of almost kind of like, I, I, like an anarchy, an, an, an anarchy of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And so you get like buttons or pins, which for years had been primarily the currency of campaigns, like political campaigns, um, literal political campaigns, different movements, et cetera. And that's what, that's what buttons were mainly used for. And then buttons are now about bands or about like groups of like different kind of like subcultural tribes. And so the literal kind of like, the literal like symbols are like the material form that these symbols were carried in of, of a kind of political groups, ideologies, movements, et cetera, was transferred into the sphere of culture. And so I think culture was taking up a lot of what was previously done by politics not that there's like an absolute line between the two but just like thinking these, this is like how I was working through um these concepts so this show was about dealing with trying to grapple with all of that yeah really interesting and powerful and uh, maybe yeah it's already uh 8 15 Zagreb time maybe before we started with q a I also wanted to say that you are preparing a new body of work that is going to be also shown in this uh, exhibition in a physical version so would you like to tell us something about it or we will keep it uh, as a surprise uh, i mean i so it will generally be a continuation like an expansion of this kind of like human animal like subcultural like merger because I, I i i feel like this this is the body of work that i'm still like working through and like the like Says. understanding grappling with with this it feels really important yeah i'm really really excited to see it wow uh juliana times go so quickly with you and it's such a been an honor and delight to speak with you and maybe uh there's a little time for a q a i see there's uh some questions maybe peter uh can help me with the uh, 
Yes, absolutely sure. Uh, well, thank you both for uh, a fascinating talk, a really engrossing talk, and it's been great to hear you and so open, uh, particularly Juliana, about your practice and your work, work, your journey to where you are now. It's been an absolute pleasure to listen to that. So we have a, a number of uh, a few questions, and we'll just do these questions. If you've got any more, uh, any of our speakers want to add any more in, put them in the q and I've noticed a few in chat too. So I'll go through the the chat ones first, yeah, um, and then I'll go to the, uh, the Q&A one too. Or I could probably do them all through the chat as well, actually. But if you've got any more, anyone else who's listening now, put the questions into the Q&A section. So the first one is from uh, Thomas. This is... Uh, it was directly at you, Juliana. Uh, in the zoo sexuality photographs on the bed, it appears that the images are printed across various sheets of paper, question mark. If so, was this a result of the technology you had during COVID restrictions, or does the constructed physicality of the image further add to the construction of a fictional character? Um, what, what type of paper? I, I wonder if Tom might mean the uh, wallpaper that we um, um, that's in the uh, oh, shows, oh. the physical shows, yeah, yeah, the physical shows as well as the virtual show as well, yeah. I think he was so referring I... to photographs and how did you make this? I mean, it's yeah. obviously that it's on the wallpaper, but I think the, the photographs. Yeah, I think that's just the like yes. that's just like how it appears in the digital space. But it was they were printed. The images were printed on canvas and then I also would collage different like little pieces like like um, collaged actual photo photo prints because I like when there's like a slight difference in like texture and things like that and so it was like photo prints on top of canvas with the buttons and then they were embed they were kind of like embedded in these I wanted to use sort of like basic almost like wood that you would find at like a farm or something um for the borders um and then the borders have both these like little bumper stickers that i made um these these bumper stickers like the like these right here that, that are being shown and then there's also buttons um on each one that i that i made Sorry for uh, misquoting uh, Tom's question. I, I thought that might be the case and typical of me to get that slightly wrong. Um, another question from uh, Helen. Uh, what do you think of Black Twitter being, being structured as a call and response strategy as was used by slaves in what is called the field holler? Uh, also, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. It's a beautiful and inspiring to listen to you, which I echo those things too. But to, to go back to that, that first part of the question, what do you think of Black Twitter being structured as a call and response strategy as was used by slaves in what is, co is called the field holler? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm sure there's some of that there. I would be, I'm like reticent to fully say that that's call and response just because I feel like Twitter is kind of anarchic in a lot of ways. I think certain, there are certain kind of like memes, like the like, like where someone will literally pull out a call or, and then they'll put like an image or like a phrase or something and then everyone else reblogs and like shares that. Like there are moments where I think like that, 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 that kind of comparison could be true, but I would be reticent to say all of Black Twitter is that because it just encompasses so many different things. And the unfortunate side of like, I think Twitter as a mostly, like, yes, there is a desktop form of Twitter, but as mostly mobile format is that they're one of, and this is one of the things I find frustrating about the switch to mobile technology is that the form is almost, the form is generally dictated by the corporation that's designing the user interface. Um, and it's really not so modular. And that, that's the other thing I liked about Tumblr is that Tumblr for me was the last um, popular social media format um, that still allowed customization, you know, 
where there's like a rubric, there's a, a skeletal structure provided to you by Tumblr. And yes, Tumblr is a corporation that like that has a user interface, but the design of your blog itself is completely up to, and your actual, you know, is completely like modular and you can like tweak it and customize it and add things and put in music or whatever. Um, and so I think that I, I, I'm also reticent for those reasons. Excellent. Thank you for that, Julian. One quick question for me. This may may not make any sense, <laughs> typical of me, but one thing I've noticed lately, well, we've all noticed Facebook and Tumblr have started to really moderate how people use the spaces or get more draconian on what you can and can't say. Do you think that would have sort of stymied your development as an artist back in the day when you were using Tumblr? Was it much more open and much more free to experiment with? Um, I'm not sure. Like, I, I feel like I would have just adopted to, to anything to a certain degree, but I, yeah, I, I feel like it's kind of, I can't fully answer that question because I, I got to experience desktop, like fully in this, like in something like this cultural moment in the past, like 10 years, I, was able to experience like desktop and, but desktop has a fully social media, you know, like I would also also share party flyers. And that's the thing that I loved about being in like New York was that there was this direct kind of feedback loop between kind of Tumblr culture. And then like people that I was meeting at events that I was going to like readings that were being organized shows, etc. cetera. Um, but I mean, I definitely feel I don't feel inspired at all to utilize um, maybe Twitter a little bit more just because I think what I also resent about so much, so much social media now is that, that thinking about kind of like authenticity, literally it's like assumed that there's like a person, like you as the person that you are, as you look, as you walk through the world are assumed to be the person behind the blog. And there's like a kind of, or behind the social media account. Like that's why I kind of like meme accounts. Like I think meme accounts are somewhat interesting because at least you still have anonymity or just play an identity. But I resent um, the general shift to, this is the person, the person, what's being expressed here is a direct reflection of the identity or like internal terrain of the person who's producing or sharing the content, but um, generally I feel it's it's much more restrictive. Mm -hmm. It's much more restrictive. And I think that mobile technology is fascinating in a lot of ways, but it's like, I, I, I find myself constantly, and it took me, it, I only came to this realization actually in quarantine because I had so much time to reflect. I was like, what is it that annoys me about this? Like I'm fully in it, fully on Instagram, fully on Twitter, whatever but I couldn't quite put my finger on what I felt was missing. And then I understood because I was articulating it in other ways, like, oh, it's, it's more image-based than text-based. You know, I was trying to like really understand. And then I realized it's actually the shift from desktop to mobile mm. um, and all of the things that came with that that I find restricting. Interesting, uh, for, uh, our final question tonight is uh, from Emma. You've mentioned authenticity a few times. Do you think that attitude to authenticity changed with the move from desktop to mobile internet? And how is that reflected, explored at all in your practice? Um, I do, I mean, I think, I, think, I think it already started beforehand because I think, I think the wealth of information that exists online is a reflection of kind of this idealized notion of the information age or something like that is, is was already doing that but like to me even like the screenshot is a really important like like mm -hmm. transition and how we relate to the production of images the capturing of images the sharing of images the possess the possession of images and i mean with your phone you can both access almost all of what exists online, but you can also immediately have that image for yourself. It's so easy just to capture, save, bookmark, do whatever. And I do think that that increased the kind of 
insane circulation of images and the just the like chop, share, cut, you know, like refigure, draw over, like it's really, really, really fast. And so I do think that it accelerated um, the separation of like aesthetics, images, et cetera, from, I think at a certain point there was like an idea that like you had to have a right to an image or you have to have a right to perform a certain thing or that performing a certain thing implied that you had an authentic relationship to it. And I definitely think that's not the case now. Fantastic, thank you, a great answer there. So Marina, uh, over to you. Do you have some final closing comments? Uh, I've really enjoyed this uh, uh, conversation. I mean, uh, <laughs> one hour and a half. And uh, yeah, I just want to thank you for your time, Juliana. And I hope you also enjoyed. I'm not sure is there any questions, but uh, I think you gave a great like glimpse into your artistic practice and how you develop it, especially which is interesting. It may be mostly photographic and media related public. Uh, that you are still didn't exhibit it so much. So for me, that was really, really important. Yeah. Great, thank, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I, I think um, we'll we'll wrap it up there then. I, um, I'll just make a few closing uh, remarks myself is to say to everyone who's listening and maybe listening afterwards, if we disseminate this talk is go to uh, formatfestival.com to find the portal into the New Art City space, but that's uh, format.newart.city. You can go into this amazing virtual space that features Marina's uh, exhibition uh, and also, of course, Juliana's work that we've, we've showed uh, a little earlier today. But if you go onto the formatfestival.com website, you'll find out information about more talks. On the 7th of April, Marina's doing a tour and the 23rd of April, she's doing a talk with Martin Gutierrez. Uh, but there's a lot of other talks that have, some have already taken place, only a few, but there's a lot more great talks, workshops, education events, participatory events, tours coming on over the course of the festival. Uh, and plenty of time to go into that virtual space and see all those 19 amazing rooms with amazing works in from around the world. So I'd like to say uh, a huge thank you to Beth, our volunteers, helping to help tonight. Debbie Cooper, um, a format producer who produced the uh, virtual festival along with the curatorial team. My uh, fantastic colleague, uh, Neil Treacy, who uh, uh, is the format festival coordinator who's facilitated this talk for us tonight. Thank you to all the uh, people who came along to the talk. It's uh, great to see you all. Thank you so very much. And I, final but very, very certainly not by any least, is uh, my thanks to... Uh, Juliana and to Marina, it's been a fascinating talk. I think it's great to see that an hour and a half has flown by, and that's always a good sign. Um, to uh, Marina in uh, Zagreb and Juliana in New York City, uh, thank you so much. Very, uh, oh, put my teeth back in. Thank you both very much. So, so very much. Um, and uh, enjoy your evening. Thank you all for coming, and thank you. Thank you all.